So before we get to the revolutions of 1848, which will be our last big topic in the time in the in this part about the political effects of industrialization, we've got to do a quick side tangent and talk about political nationalism. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about political nationalism in the later videos after we finish the political effects of industrialization. But we need to talk about nationalism here simply to understand what's going to happen in 1848. So we're just going to do a quick little discussion of political nationalism before we dive into what's going to happen in 1848. So this ideology was lurking underneath everything else we've been talking about. So, yes, we've been talking about, like, economic class and suffrage. So these things were motivational. This is what was motivating all of these ideologies that we've been talking about. Nationalism, though, is way more motivational than anything else. This is way more motivational than any of this other stuff we've been talking about, extending the right to vote, economic class, working conditions, all of that stuff pales in comparison to how motivational nationalism is. So let's define this. What is nationalism? So nationalism is simply the motivation to identify, nope, identify with members of your nation. Now, your nation is simply the group of people with similar characteristics. Usually it has something to do with geography, culture, language, uh, cuisine, dress, religion, so it's the people that are around you and share a culture and history with you. Like you have a common culture and a common history and you all usually live in the same place. You all usually speak the same language. You eat the same food, you dress the same, you practice the same religion. More or less, that's what the nation is. And this is what drove the Americans to declare independence. Because they had a different culture 
and they had a different shared history than the British did. It's also what drove Latin America to break away from Spain. Same thing. They are different geographically, culturally. They have a different shared history. They interpret history different than the people in Spain do, just like the Americans had a different shared history than they had in Great Britain. This is also what drove the French people to join the Revolutionary Army and later Napoleon's army to defend the revolution and the French nation against the absolutists. And as Napoleon conquered Europe, He spread the idea of nationalism everywhere he went. So as he is kind of forcing conquered people to join his army, They're learning about nationalism from the French. And this was seen especially among the Germans. Because as they were kind of pressed into Napoleon's army, the Germans learned about nationalism and realized that they had a lot more in common all of this stuff, they have a shared culture, a shared language, a shared history, then what divided them, which were really just old political borders. So there was a lot more uniting the Germans than dividing the Germans, and really all that was dividing them were these weird political borders that, as the Germans are starting to realize, don't really matter. But we'll worry about this idea more in the coming videos. Now, before we start talking about the revolutions, And we'll look at a very brief example of one here in a second. We have to see how nationalism interacts with other ideologies.
So generally, conservatives hated nationalism. They saw it as dangerous and revolutionary because they associated it with the French Revolution. So they viewed nationalism as a dangerous thing. Liberals kind of liked it because they thought they could control it. It was a force that liberals could use to their advantage, and they did. So guys like George Washington and Simone Bolivar were both liberals who harnessed nationalism for their own ends. And so what we'll see moving forward is that liberals are going to try to use nationalism to varying degrees of success. And they thought they could because guys like George Washington and Simone Bolivar did. The last group we'll talk about are socialists. Socialists also hated nationalism, but for a different reason. They thought that it distracted people from the economic problems. Like it was an unnecessary division. So what I want to do very quickly is just go over a very simple example of this. And we'll talk about more examples of this as we move into uh, the later part of time period three. But what I want to look at real quick is the struggle for Greek independence. Now, the Greeks were part of the Ottoman Empire. So we've got an empire, a conservative empire. And while it wasn't part of the concert of Europe, it was a stabilizing force on the outskirts of Europe. And Metternich viewed it as a necessary piece of the puzzle. Now, the Greeks had been in the Ottoman Empire since like the 1500s. And although there were periodic uprisings for independence, the Greeks were largely pacified until the 1800s 
when Napoleon unleashed nationalism. And like almost immediately, the Greeks rise up again. So this happens in 1821. So in 1821, the Greeks start fighting for independence. And the initial reaction by the concert of Europe was dismay. They were really upset that this was happening because even though the Ottomans aren't really a friend, they're also not necessarily the enemy either. And this sets a bad example. So really, the great power is just kind of furrow their brows and wring their hands at this and they're they don't like it but they're also not going to get involved in it either the problem is the people of europe and really the people of the world but we're, we're really worried about the people of europe love this and they start raising money and uh, complaining to their governments. To do something for the Greeks. Like we owe so much to the Greeks. Like ancient Greece gave us democracy and geometry and all of these things that we, we hold dear because of the Renaissance, it's all because of the Greeks. We have to do something to help them. And so eventually, in 1827, the UK and France cave to public opinion. And help the Greeks militarily and they're aided by another great power one that you might not expect which was russia russia helps too now you might be asking yourself why does russia help too russia is the most conservative of all of the great powers and they want to stomp out any revolution before it starts and you're not wrong but here's why. The Ottomans were executing Orthodox priests for their part in the independence movement. And Russia saw itself as the protector of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. This is also going to become a issue down the road. So just keep that idea in mind. File it away. It's going to come up again later. And by 1830, the Ottomans were asking to negotiate. Now, 
So they negotiate and Greece becomes independent. You might ask yourself, why does Metternich go along with this? Metternich was nothing if he wasn't a pragmatist. He was a realist. And this outcome was the best of all the bad outcomes that could have happened. This was a quick end to a conflict that could have been much worse. And so the Ottomans are going to be okay without Greece. We've let everybody be happy for a little while and we've given the Greeks independence. We have another player on the board that Metternich can try to control. So all in all, it's not the worst outcome. Obviously the best outcome would have been if this had never happened, but Metternich couldn't control that. So this was the next best thing, a quick end to the conflict. Greece is now independent. The British are happy. The Russians are happy and everybody can go back to trying to be conservative again. The problem is that now that we've unleashed nationalism all across Europe, no one is going to be content being conservative and we're going to see things pop up like the Greek independence movement all throughout Europe. And it's going to happen in places that Metternich wants to control and can't. And this is going to set the stage for what happens in 1848, which we will turn to now in our next set of videos. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.